Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our uh, webinar on current issues in FDA priority review voucher programs. My name is Jeremiah Kelly. I'm a partner here at Venable's uh, Food and Drug Law Group here in Washington, DC. I'm joined by my partner, Justin Kuhn, uh, by my associate, Richard Starr. We're coming to you live from the Senator uh, by room at 600 Mass Avenue, uh, right down here in the heart of the nation's capital. And we're excited to jump in and talk about priority review vouchers with you this afternoon. Um, most of uh, most of you guys understand, uh, you know, Venable is a pretty, pretty large uh, full service law firm. We've got offices all across the country. Um, but what is uh, often um, an element just to make sure folks are very clear about is we actually have an incredibly robust life science team that includes really a powerhouse intellectual property group, a full service food and drug law group, uh, full capability in terms of um, commercialization and licensing. And uh, we can really bring to bear our, our capability for uh, our clients full suite of legal needs, especially in the FDA regulated arena. Uh, as you know, FDA regulates a quarter of the US economy and there's not any element of that uh, regulatory jurisdiction that our team does not cover. In particular, uh, Justin and I have come here to Venable just in the last six months from the Department of Defense, where I was the chief of the FDA Regulatory Law Division for the US Army Medical Research and Development Command. Justin was our chief counsel for the Joint Program Executive Office for Chem Bio Defense. So not only have we been doing uh, FDA regulated product development for a number of years, I had been in the commissioner's office at FDA. Justin had served in the Senate Finance Committee for a number of years. And most recently, we came out of three years in $83 billion of COVID-19 pandemic response, which included drugs, vaccines, uh, diagnostic capability to respond to the pandemic. I'm really glad to have Richard, our associate here, joining us today, who's really got an incredible uh, regulatory acumen and breadth of experience, both in how FDA regulates medical products but also where that crosses over into how FTC uh, regulates the advertising of those, re uh, of those regulated products. So that's the team before you here today. We're gonna jump in substantively. And again, thanks for joining us. Here's our agenda. Um, I'll say that of all of the, the regulatory issues, um, there's just not a lot of food and drug law teams that have a experience with dealing with priority review vouchers. Uh, for many, it seems like this kind of esoteric, kind of strange, uh, statutory creation uh, that is really, um, you know, not always part and parcel of a product development effort. So we're going to ask fundamental questions, answer fundamental questions about what is a priority review voucher or PRV. We're also going to spend some time looking at the current valuations of PRVs, what we're seeing in the marketplace as these PRVs are sold. And uh, as we'll get into, there are actually three statutory PRV programs for uh, tropical diseases, for rare pediatric diseases and for material threat medical countermeasures. And we're going to look at the elements that are common to all three programs. Then we'll dive into each program specific criteria, offer a few practice tips because as of say later, our team has uh, dealt with every kind of priority review voucher and then dealt with them in the context of really the full products life cycle, whether you're looking at eligibility on the back end or on the front end or on the back end, whether you've sold them or you have to appeal an agency decision, or even if there's a dispute between a buyer and seller of a PRV. We'll also spend some time looking at recent legislative developments as it relates to these programs, give some general practice tips, and we hope to reserve some time for Q&A, which uh, certainly you can throw those questions and answers in the chat throughout our presentation today. Before we start talking about priority review vouchers, it's important to understand where this all comes from. In 2007, in the Food Drug Administration Amendments Act of 07, just before that, there was an article published in Health Affairs by David Ridley and Henry Grabowski that basically said the ability for the agency to move faster is actually a lucrative uh, incentive. It can actually be an asset. And the idea of a voucher stems from the original Prescription Drug User Fee Act of 1992, which introduced what we know as priority review. Most of us who've been in the food and drug law community for years understand that priority review itself is an expedited approval mechanism. The guidance uh, face uh, is referenced here on the slide. It's linked to the slides. You can find that yourself. But there are certain criteria for things like fast track, accelerated approval, breakthrough therapy designation, RMAT, 
breakthrough device designation and to priority review. And to foot stomp the summary of what priority review is, it really is what it sounds like. You get a six month review clock versus the standard 10 month uh, review clock under the prescription drug user fee framework. Of course, most of you know, we're operating now under Purdue 7, but you only get priority review if there is, uh, the product is intended to treat a serious condition. And if your data suggests that that product would provide a significant improvement in safety and efficacy. So stepping back kind of to understand the policy driver of both priority review and the vouchers, you tend to incentivize unmet medical needs where there's a serious condition, uh, where, where we really need uh, essentially, you know, breakthrough technology. Uh, so priority review is also available where you're uh, doing a label change via a supplement for um, compliance with the Pediatric Research Equity Act, where you're a qualified in infectious disease product or what we call a QUIDIP under the GAIN Act of uh, 2016. And also you get priority review anytime you submit something called a priority review voucher. What exactly is the voucher? Uh, it's a regulatory incentive where FDA grants the voucher when the agency approves a sponsor's medical product, drug or biologic, in one of the three statutorily specified categories. And when that voucher is issued, it guarantees its recipient priority review for its subsequent uh, drug application. It guarantees its recipient a six month review clock for the future human drug application. PRVs can be applied to any subsequent application so long as um, the, uh, the active ingredients, you can get a PRV, excuse me, uh, for any drug application so long as the active ingredient of that product is unapproved. In other words, it's never been subject to 505B1 uh, or uh, the FDNC Act or 351A of the Public Health Service Act. Uh, and when you get a PRV, when the agency issues this uh, lucrative incentive, the sponsor has two options. You can retain that voucher and use it on a subsequent application, uh, which would not be constrained by product class. So for example, if a sponsor receives a PRV for a tropical disease, you get awarded that voucher at the approval of that tropical disease uh, product, you are not constrained if you decide to use the voucher by being in a tropical disease uh, space. You can actually use that voucher for, for, for anything so long um, as, uh, uh, as it's a human drug application. The other option is that you can take that voucher and you can sell that voucher for an immediate return on investment. Uh, you typically sell it to a third party sponsor who would like to use it for their subsequent product application. And that's really where we see the economic power for a lot of, uh, of product developers undertaking research and development. There've been about two dozen PRVs sold the purchase prices range from $67 million to $350 million. And essentially this is what we call a pool incentive. It's designed to incentivize research and development in these three statutory underserved uh, patient areas uh, so that we can actually see product development, see FDA approvals uh, for these underserved categories. And the ability to sell it, or even the ability to go faster at FDA becomes a very powerful incentive. So it's pulling you through the FDA regulatory paradigm as many of us are familiar with push-pull incentives. Uh, I love it that our graphics team was able to kind of depict this uh, because if uh, we didn't have this, I'd probably, I'd be on a whiteboard somewhere diagramming it, but this just depicts the two options that you have. If your drug or biologic, is, is novel and it gets approved for one of the three uh, statutory PRV programs, you get the priority review voucher. So here it looks like it's a raffle ticket. Uh, we've made analogies to the Disney Fast Pass program. That's what it was back in my day with my kids. I think it's now called the Genie Plus program where you pay a little extra when you go to Disney, but you get to go faster uh, to the head of the line. If you get this special PRV ticket, then again, you can keep it in your back pocket and your company can use it on a subsequent human drug application, or you can sell that PRV to uh, another firm. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin to go over uh, what we're seeing in terms of the commercial value of PRVs. Thanks, Jeremiah. Now that the, the, uh, the first PRV program was enacted in 2007, so we have about 15 years worth of data. Um, and 
really what we've seen is, is there has been a market that's emerged, a secondary market for priority review vouchers. Um, and as you can see here, it's, it's basically the market is driven by supply of the vouchers and demand. Um, the blue lines on this chart represent the priority review vouchers that were awarded in each year. Um, so you can see starting in 2009 was the first uh, PRV award. Um, in recent years, the number has been between five and 10 vouchers. Uh, it looks like in 2023, we're, we're on track for somewhere, uh, somewhere in that range as well. Um, and as there were more vouchers that came on the market, um, the, sale, uh, the sales started initially in 2014, um, and there was a spike um, as there were few vouchers on the market. The price uh, went as high as $350 million. Um, but really, in, in recent years, as we've had a more stable number of, of, of vouchers on the market, um, the price has also stabilized, and now we're looking anywhere in the 110 to uh, 100 to 110 million dollar range for recent sales. We've got some data here um, just on a few of the sales. Um, as Jeremiah mentioned, the lowest um, sale that occurred was actually the first one, the first voucher that was sold by Biomarin to Regeneron uh, back in 2014, sold for 67 and a half million dollars. Um, shortly after that, there were a couple of sales over $300 million, including the high water mark um, that uh, United Therapeutics Corp uh, sold, sold their voucher to AbbVie for $350 million uh, in 2015. Um, more recently, again, the, the numbers have been pretty consistent, right around $100 to $110 million. Um, and uh, just a note here at the bottom of the slide, uh, one interesting feature is that um, there have been some other sales of PRVs that were wrapped into to larger deals. So for example, there was a sale that was announced earlier this summer um, where the PRV part of the deal was only $21 million, but it was part of a pre-existing license where there was other compensation. And um, you know, one other thing I'll just mention here briefly before we move on um, is that this data that we have, um, this is not a full, full data set. Um, there's no obligation to, to report PRV sales so really what we're seeing is, is mainly the result of disclosures that were made to the SEC, uh, as well as voluntary uh, press releases from companies. So um, it's, it's possible and, and, and probably even likely that there are some additional data points that we don't have here about private sales that were never reported. At this point, I'm gonna pass it over to Richard to give an overview of the three PRV programs. Thank you, Justin and Jeremiah. Uh, so we've talked a bit about uh, the basics of how priority review vouchers work, what their value is. So now we're going to start beginning, begin to answer, how do you even get a P, uh, priority review voucher? Uh, as Jeremiah and Justin have mentioned, there's three statutory vehicles through which you can get a, a priority review voucher. There's a tropical disease, PRV, and that's for applications for drugs for the treatment or prevention of certain tropical diseases. And this is this uh, came about as part of the uh, FADA in 2007. Then there's a rare pediatric disease PRV, and that's for applications for drugs to treat rare pediatric diseases under 529. That came about in 2012, it's part of FADASIA. Uh, and then finally, we have the most recent, the material threat medical countermeasures uh, and that came about in 2016, added through section 565A. Uh, and one thing that I'll point out here is each of these uh, statutory programs is unique in their own right. And as you can see in the timeline here, uh, as more programs have been added, if you look, uh, think back to Justin's graph from before, you can see the increase in sales and additional number of PRVs available on the market, partially because over time, more statutory vehicles have been added. Um, and there's a few common features uh, of all these PRV programs. First of all, it must be a novel drug or biologic. Uh, there's no eligibility for a particular disease for a PRV where the active moiety of the drug proposed or the active ingredient of the biologic proposed have been previously approved under 505B or 351. Uh, it also, of course, must be a human drug application. Uh, and for post-enactment approval, each program only incentivizes approvals post-enactment. And the key thing to remember here is there are really no guarantees. Eligibility for a priority review needs to be established. 
uh, uh, before you go through the approval process. Uh, and for all of this to work smoothly uh, in an ideal world, uh, companies first go through the process of establishing eligibility. The drug then needs to be approved to receive the PRV. And then the drug that uses the PRV would be approved. But of course, there's no guarantee that when you use a PRV on a later drug application, there's no guarantee that it will be approved. So there are plenty of cases where someone uses a PRV and doesn't actually end up getting the approval that they were looking for for that drug. Thus, you could call it wasting uh, a voucher in that example. Uh, and of, of course, PRVs are transferable by contract without limit. Uh, when you use a PRV, you need to give FDA notice uh, 90 days ahead of time before doing so. Uh, and there's also uh, uh, user fees for the use of the PRV specifically, beyond just the PDUFA fees. And so these days, uh, the, uh, the PRV user fee is specifically $1.52 million. This is, again, in addition to any PDUFA fees that you're already paying. Uh, that you would through any normal process. Uh, and I'll kick it back to Jeremiah here to talk about the tropical disease PRV program. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Richard. We're going to dive in now to each of the three statutory programs. I'm going to take tropical diseases. Richard will do rare pediatric diseases. And then Justin will uh, round us out here with material threat medical countermeasures. It's important to remember that this was actually the very first program. The tropical disease PRV program comes from the Food Drug Administration Amendments Act of 07, where the predominant concerns really were drug safety. If you guys remember, that was where you got uh, REMS and post-market commitments and uh, safety label change authority. Buried in that statute was this very innovative incentive called a priority review voucher. Uh, I'm not sure everybody knew what it was at the time. Um, but, but basically, the, the nice thing about this particular program as compared to the other two is that the tropical disease PRV program is permanent. There's no sunset provision in uh, the statute at 21 USC 360N. And the ability for the agency to award a tropical disease PRV is limited to those indications that are treating or curing or preventing a tropical disease that is listed in the statute. So at 360N, if you look it up, there's actually, we're gonna show you an excerpt here, there's actually a list of tropical diseases that the Congress has authorized PRVs to be awarded for. They've also included language that allows FDA to do this via order. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, over time, each of these statutes has evolved. Congress, you know, sometimes at FDA's urging, has constrained the ability for the, the FDA to award PRVs. There have been additional criteria added. Uh, the, the third bullet here was actually added in 2017 to require that the application have new clinical investigations that are essential to approval and that those clinical investigations be conducted or sponsored by the sponsor of the drug application. What people were, what, I think what uh, the Congress was responding to was folks essentially licensing a clinical dossier or getting the transfer and IND, not really investing any money whatsoever, getting approvals, getting this powerful voucher that can be sold for a windfall and then companies essentially vacate the space by going out of business and really, it's, um, this was intended to curb some perceived abuses of the program. In addition, uh, there is a requirement that the uh, tropical disease product application sponsor include an attestation that uh, none of the clinical investigations and reports were submitted to another regulatory authority kind of in the tropical disease range uh, geographically, India, Brazil, Thailand, or any of our PIC or PICS uh, companies. Some examples, right here you can see an excerpt we've lifted from 21 USC 360A3, which is the full list of uh, enumerated tropical diseases from the statute, includes some big ticket ones, especially if you're coming from a DOD background, malaria, dengue, cholera, leishmaniasis, there's others on here that you will be very familiar with. But what is not listed on the right side of the slide is what we've included via text here at section 360NA3S. And that text allows the agency to add any other infectious disease to this list for which there's no significant market in developed nations and that disproportionately affects poor marginalized populations. The secretary of HHS through its 
delegated authority down to the FDA commissioner, can designate by order additional uh, tropical diseases to be on this list. Chagas, chikungunya, rabies, loss of fever, for example, have been added by order. And it's also interesting to know, um, filovirus, for example, not typically uh, evaluated as a tropical disease. It actually can, you know, shows up most of the time in, in the middle part of Africa and the Congo. Um, but that was added. Congress can add anything to this list, whether we think it is historically via a medical textbook defined as a tropical disease. A couple practice tips for the tropical disease PRV program here. The first one is be grateful. If you're doing tropical disease product development, uh, you have a permanent program, so you don't have to worry about the sunset provisions that these gentlemen are going to talk about. The other thing is it's important for you to monitor FDA's open docket for proposed tropical disease uh, additions to uh, the statutory eligibility. And where you don't see your, tip, tip, uh, uh, your indication eligible via the statute or other orders, there is the opportunity for you to file a petition to the docket to argue for the addition of that particular disease. And the rationales that are built into both the additions by order and then also the denials with regard to how to justify uh, being related to uh, an insufficient market or, or whether or not your product will help a disproportionately uh, poor marginalized population. Those rationales that are at that docket are incredibly helpful if you need to go this route. Uh, the other important practice tip is to mention and foot stomp here the 2017 amendment, new clinical investigations essential to approval conducted by or sponsored by. This terminology tracks the language that is in the marketing exclusivity paradigms at 21 CFR 314.50 J4. However, the statute does not define these terms. We interpret them coextensively for the most part with the marketing exclusivity language, but, but that's not absolutely required. And these incentive frameworks are different. Uh, exclusivity is a different type of incentive than the voucher. And so it's not always appropriate to use that language. And oftentimes there is opportunity uh, where the agency may want to apply that terminology as it historically done, but it might not make sense uh, in, in the context of your tropical disease PRV program. Uh, another important thing that stems from this is in licensing or out licensing clinical data or the transfer of any IND pre nd submission or pre BLA submission uh, will likely have to deal with whether or not these investigations were conducted by or sponsored by the applicant. And there is a way in the exclusivity terms at 314, 20 CFR 314, to essentially have a, a transition of uh, clinical investigations where you maintain eligibility for exclusivity, you have to be equally careful to maintain eligibility for a priority review voucher in these transfers of your clinical dossier and the IND itself. I also want to pause just for our friends here who are taking this course for CLE. Our CLE code is Venable FDA 23. That's V E N A B L E F D A 23. And I'll turn it over to Richard to talk about rare pediatric disease PRVs. You got the short uh, straw here, buddy. This is the hardest one. <laughs> yeah, so the PRV program is a unique regulatory, regulatory tool across the world. The rare pediatric disease program uh, steps it up a, yet another level. Uh, and it's meant to make it possible to, of course, receive a PRV for developing a drug for the treatment of a rare pediatric disease. What is that, you ask? It's a serious or life-threatening disease in which the serious or life-threatening manifestations primarily affect individuals aged from birth to 18 years. Uh, and the rare part here is that it needs to qualify as an orphan drug, which uh, in the, the headline here is that it needs to be less than 200,000 people in the United States that it affects. Uh, the application also must rely on clinical data in a pediatric population under 360 FF. And the application may not seek approval for an adult indication in the original rare pediatric disease product application, also under 360 FF. Uh, I I will oh, a few. Uh, I will note here if an adult indication is for the same disease and the original application includes the pediatric indication, this should not destroy eligibility. Uh, but I do want to focus first a little bit more on that first definition there. 
uh, on manifestations. And manifestations are the expressions and symptoms of the disease. And ones that are only serious or life-threatening in adulthood, of course, hence the name, do not qualify. And those manifestations must be serious even after controlling for the standard of care treatment. Uh, PRVs, the entire program, uh, are meant to be used for novel drugs, novel treatments, solving a problem by, by plugging a gap in the available treatments for certain diseases. So of course, that's going to be a factor there. Uh, also, the timing and progression of those manifestations is taken into account to the extent those manifestations affect childhood development uh, or become progressively more serious. Those are often taken into account and make it more likely uh, that a particular disease could be a voucherable target. Uh, so, again, the, the, the RPD PRV program is, is quite unique. Uh, and it also, it offers an incentive for the production of drugs that uh, may otherwise never be made, uh, but it's always been under the threat of sunset. Uh, even at its inception, the program was established as a kind of trial set to expire after uh, the first three PRVs were awarded under the statute. Uh, but over time, Congress has uh, continued the program, not on the basis of the number of PRVs awarded, but uh, via time extensions, typically uh, by four years at a time. Uh, right now, it's set to essentially sunset on September 30th, 2026. Uh, and although the RPD PRV program was created uh, at the same time uh, proof of five went into effect, those timelines are no longer aligned. Again, this is every four years. Um, so at this point, the RPD program would need to be extended via its own statutory vehicle uh, or as part of a larger continuing approach package uh, as it's been before. And the one other thing that I'll note, you'll see at the top here, uh, and this is unique to the rare pediatric disease program again, it's that uh, sponsors can actually request a designation of a rare pediatric disease before the NDA submission uh, and again, this needs to be done at the time of the orphan disease designation or other fast track designation. Uh, a few practice tips here. Uh, FDA can, again, conditionally designate a marketing application as a rare pediatric uh, disease product application pending a final determination of uh, approval. This is the closest that you get to uh, a sure thing in these P, uh, PRV programs uh, with respect to knowing before you get approval that you actually will get the designation uh, through one of the statutory vehicles. Uh, also, specifically for this rare disease program, uh, absolutely monitor the sunset uh, provision in this uh, the upcoming few years uh, with this wind down period. Uh, Congress is likely to extend the program again. They've done so for uh, several years now, several occasions that they've done it. Um, and the also, as I mentioned before, the rare pediatric disease designation request needs to be done uh, at the same time or within 14 days of the orphan drug designation. Uh, and going back to the first slide here, uh, in the designation process and uh, determining eligibility for the disease and drug product uh, for eligibility for the rare pediatric disease designation. Uh, a lot of upfront legwork uh, needs to be done to determine whether or not the manifestations at issue of the disease, the standard of care uh, <coughs> use, and the drug itself actually do uh, uh, promise eligibility, if, if speak to whether or not the drug and the uh, disease are actually a vouchable target. And this is again going to focus on the manifestations and will require a good deal of research in the medical literature. And uh, that upfront legwork is uh, quite worth it. Good. That's a great point. Okay. We'll now turn it over to Justin here to talk about our material threat medical countermeasure PRV program. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jeremiah. Thanks, Richard. Um, so now we come to the third and the most recent of the PRV programs. Um, and this, this program just came about in 2016. 
And it really was a result of, of two things. Um, first, there was a need uh, both within the Department of Defense as well as the Department of Health and Human Services um, to develop products for uh, our nation's security and also um, preparedness. Um, and, and like the other two PRV areas, um, those are products where there isn't much of a return in the commercial market. Um, oftentimes the only sales of these products are to government agencies, um, typically small quantities, and that's a very difficult business model um, and becomes difficult to justify investment um, among other opportunities. Um, so based on the, the, the success of the other PRV programs, um, our team was actually uh, involved with and instrumental with drafting this legislation that became of the part of the 21st Century Cures Act. Jeremiah in particular um, was, was a key part of drafting that legislation. Um, and what this program does is it is, establishes a similar incentive for material threat medical countermeasures. Um, and so I'm just going to give a little background here first about what's eligible for the PRV. As the name indicates, uh, the, the, the target here is um, products that prevent or treat harm from biological, chemi chemical, radiological, or nuclear threats. Um, and, and that's really kind of the crux of it. So you're looking at those seaburn threats, they're also known as seaburn threats, um, which are defined under the Public Health Service Act, Section 319F. Now, one of the, the catches with the way that the current statute is drafted is that the threat list, the list of eligible threats for the Material Threat Medical Countermeasure PRV program, is actually maintained by the Department of Homeland Security. And there's a process that's laid out in the statute whereby the, the DHS secretary will consult with the secretary of HHS and other agencies. Um, and it's, a very, it's an assessment based on ongoing security needs in the C, CBRN space. Um, and really, the, the focus is on uh, the agents, the threat agents that pose a material threat to national security. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but one of the issues with the current statute is that that threat list that's compiled by DHS is not necessarily coextensive with the threats, particularly that face the Department of Defense. Um, and, and many of the threats that, that DOD faces overshores or uh, is are unique threats that are not necessarily here in the United States. So um, those threats may not currently be eligible to receive a, a priority review voucher. And that's one of the things that, again, we'll come back to that in a moment. So unlike the, the tropical disease PRV uh, program, the material threat medical countermeasure PRV program does have a statutory end date, which is coming up very soon. In fact, it's within the next two months uh, if there's no congressional action, uh, this program will sunset as of October 1st of 2023. Um, so another, uh, another difference with the, the tropical threat PRV program, uh, sorry, between the tropical disease PRV program and the material threat PRV program, there's no public list here. Um, so, so really companies that are seeking to develop countermeasures in the space are at somewhat of an information deficit. Um, really, the best resource that we have, the best public resource, is a list that's compiled by the Public Health Emergency Medical Countermeasure Enterprise, which is a mouthful. <laughs> so we'll just call it FEMC. <laughs> um, but FEMC will periodically compile uh, and prepare a strategic uh, report, um, which was last updated in 2022. Uh, and in a moment, I'll show you the current list. But there is a list in that report, which is about as close as you're going to get to, um, to a list of eligible um, targets under this PRB program. And then finally, one feature of the current statute uh, in the 21st Century Cures Act is that GAO was required to do a study of all PRV programs to look at the de uh, drug development impact. Um, and uh, this study was published in 2020. Uh, and I think in, in many respects, it actually was a very good study. There's some good analysis there of the number of, of PRVs that were awarded, um, sales data, uh, information about the timing between the time of when a PRV is awarded and when it was ultimately redeemed. Um, but really, one of the limitations in this study is it didn't take into account um, feedback from, from the whole government, um, and, and particularly the DOD um, was not consulted in preparation of the study. So there wasn't really any um, 
any discussion of how effective this program might be for DOD purposes. So here's the list of, um, of high priority threats that was published in the most recent FEMC study uh, plan uh, just last year. Um, and a, a few notes here right off the top. So you can see um, this list is broken down into three categories. Uh, first, you have biological threats, which is the biggest category. And then you have chemical threats. And then the third category is radiological and nuclear threats, which are kind of lumped together under a single entry there. Um, it might be hard to see, but there are some items here that have a star next to them. And those are the items that, according to this FEMC report, um, actually have a corresponding material threat determination. And that is what makes these specific threats eligible for a PRV. Now, part of the difficulty here is that the material threat determinations are not necessarily publicly available. So um, if you're relying on this list, there is uh, some amount of trust in the accuracy uh, of, of the list, and you may not be able to verify everything that's on here independently. One entry that I do want to specifically mention here, um, which is interesting, is the emerging infectious diseases entry. It's under biological threats, the last, last item in the left column. Um, and first off, that, that, that entry does not have a star in and of itself. Um, but it is kind of a broader category, and you also see pandemic influenzas up there. Those are actually kind of broader categories that can capture multiple threats. Um, and really the effect here is to, to evidence a policy decision that emerging infectious diseases are part of the material threat countermeasure PRV program. They can be eligible. Um, and, it, and so there's a process um, to go to DHS to get new threats uh, added, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but that has actually happened in, in the past. And actually the most recent example is COVID-19, which was added as an emerging infectious disease uh, and became eligible for uh, material threat medical countermeasure PRVs. Um, the first one that we saw awarded there was for Rendisivir uh, back at the very end of 2020. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's an example, that's a category where there is potential to add additional threats based on the existing breadth of the program. So now I'm gonna to turn to a few practice tips here. Um, and, you know, the first, the very first thing is just to monitor the activity about the sunset here. Um, I'll give a legislative update in a moment, but, but just be aware if you're developing a product in this space, this program right now is, is on life support in its final days, which could change. Um, the other thing that you'll want to do is to keep a close eye on the FEMC strategy um, and just, just be aware when there are subsequent reports that are published, take a look and see if the list has changed. Um, we are, I think our working assumption is that there will be the same framework going forward if the program continues. So that FEMC report is going to continue to have a lot of importance. Um, and, and kind of alongside of that, um, I'm jumping down to the bottom of the slide here if you're following along. But there is a means to get um, new threats added. And really that means is to work administratively through the agencies. Ultimately, it's a determination of the DHS secretary. But you'll want to work with the Department of Defense, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and, and that's kind of the right way to, to build support to add um, new threats to those lists. And you know, finally, one other thing I can add here is there are various lists of, of threats within the government. Um, the FEMC list is really the best one for this program, but there is also a, a list that's maintained by NIAID, um, which has category A and B pathogens. Uh, there is some overlap there between the lists. And uh, again, you know, that's evidence of, of the, the threats that these other, um, these other agents um, pose to national security and, and would support potential inclusion of some of those threats uh, on a future FEMC list. So um, as I mentioned, uh, really this, this PRV is about to expire. Um, if it does expire, there's a couple of negative consequences. I'll just mention these briefly. Um, so looking forward, um, the future development for products that would be eligible, um, re really the incentive goes away. So we would expect to see uh, some, some sponsors who are making hard decisions about which projects to fund um, which targets to go after. Um, if this incentive is gone, uh, some of that money may move elsewhere. 
And then for current um, MCM developments, uh, there also is potential for a negative consequence if, if those, those sponsors are not able to get a PRV before the sunset. Um, it, it, that could affect uh, funding decisions about continued um, development of the products. So it would be unfortunate to see some of those, those, those promising products that are midstream go away, but uh, unfortunately that is also a possibility. Um, so with this, with this need for legislative action does bring some opportunities here. And, and, and this is really the silver lining is that now that we've had um, seven years with this program, uh, we do see some opportunities for improvement. So the first, um, the first potential uh, improvement here is to make the program permanent. This, um, as you can see on the tropical disease side, a permanent program is really the best incentive and it provides the most security as companies are making long-term decisions, uh, particularly since the, the path, pathway to licensure is, is somewhere typically between 10 and 15 years for many of these products, um, especially given the, the need for animal rule development for, for these uh, chem bio products. Um, the second opportunity that we see would be just simply to have a publicly available list. And, and that would just give uh, interest to companies information so that they can get a better read on whether their product is going to be eligible for a PRV. And finally, due to the unique needs of DOD, um, we would just recommend that, that any legislation here include the opportunity for DOD to participate in some fashion in compiling the list. Um, it, direct participation is really the best way to ensure that those needs that protect our soldiers are going to be eligible for PRVs. So on the legislative front, um, we have seen, the good news is we have seen some action recently on a couple of, uh, a couple of coming from a couple of directions. Um, first off, the Department of Defense had sponsored legislation that was included in each of the last two National Defense Authorization Act bills. Uh, in last year's uh, bill, the FY23 NDAA, um, there was a, a pretty comprehensive um, proposal to, that would have extended the program for six years made the list publicly available and then also included DRD participation. Um, that, that proposal made it far enough, it was officially adopted by the administration um, and it had the, uh, the consent of the FDA to move forward. Unfortunately, it did not make it into the final NDAA bill that was signed into law in December. So um, based on the, the DOD's continuing need, they, they went ahead, they put this, a similar proposal in this year's NDAA bill. Um, however, that one's really just a skinny extension for six years. So that bill is still, um, still active, it's still, still viable. Um, I think there is some question about uh, the willingness of the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee to take up that legislation. Um, one of the, the roadblocks here is just that, that um, this is an amendment to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which is really outside of the comfort zone of the defense committees and their usual jurisdiction. So there are kind of some jurisdictional issues there to work through on the Hill. Um, probably the better news is that we have seen a couple of other proposals recently. Um, the first uh, came this spring from Senator Ernst, which was similar. It was a more comprehensive package, similar to the, the fiscal 23 NDA proposal. Um, but perhaps even better, um, Recently, the Senate Health Committee has taken up an amendment which was included in the uh, Pandemic All Hazards uh, Preparedness Act reauthorization bill. Um, that and this is just uh, this would just be a skinny in current draft. It's just a skinny six-year reauthorization of the PRV program. But this provision was included in the bipartisan markup that just came out of the was reported out of the Health Committee uh, within the last two or three weeks. So that's a very positive development. Um, one thing to note here, though, uh, perhaps to, to temper that uh, excitement a little bit, is just that the, uh, the corresponding House bill, um, which was uh, reported through the House Energy and Commerce Committee, did not include uh, any reauthorization of the PRV program. So there are some um, incongruities there that will have to be resolved uh, in the reconciliation process. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Jeremiah for a couple of other um, practice tips and concluding thoughts. Sure. No, that's great. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm probably not the best Starbucks aficionado, but you've got the skinny version. You've got the venti version that there, there may be some, some lanes there for a grande version somewhere in between the omnibus earned DOD proposal and just the straight date extension. So we'll have to 
pay attention to how that shakes out over the next couple months. Um, well, as I mentioned at the outset of the webinar, our team here at Venable has extensive experience in dealing with all three of the statutory priority review voucher programs. We've dealt with them um, in initial eligibility determinations. We've dealt with them as we're justifying them prior to NDA or BLA submissions. We've appealed agency decisions. Uh, we have counseled and helped facilitate the sale and auction of, of all types of vouchers. We have also helped firms uh, resolve conflicts related to the sale uh, of the vouchers. We've in, you know, uh, helped draft language for inclusion in uh, voucher sales and agreements on voucher splits within license agreements and uh, all manner of things. And so there are a few things that I think it's worth mentioning uh, in terms of practice tips that uh, probably just be helpful for everybody. Um, and they kind of fall into a couple buckets. The first bucket is determining eligibility. As Richard mentioned at the outset, each one of these uh, statutory PRV programs is distinct. And it really does require you to look at your active ingredient, active moiety, and your target indication and your target product profile to determine whether or not you would be eligible under any of the three statutes. Uh, so that's really where it starts is with this product specific analysis. And just because you may not be on the tropical disease list, or there may not be an existing material threat uh, determination under the material threat medical countermeasure PRV program, that doesn't mean that there, that's just a dead end for you. There are ways that you can work through federal agencies to establish your target indications eligibility under one of the programs. Uh, and so we're also available to help you navigate this kind of complex framework in the federal enterprise. The FEMC, of course, is a convening uh, organization via interagency agreement that pulls in DOD and Asper BARDA and the CDC, et cetera. And there are ways that to navigate this process to make sure that it is on the radar of uh, your, your federal agencies. Um, it's important to know that the priority review uh, itself, the underlying priority review is a determination made um, at the time of the NDA or BLA submission. So as much as we can project whether or not your, uh, the baseline priority review eligibility will be met, will be in many ways a comparison of what products are existing on the market now and what products may actually have already met uh, the serious condition for which your product is indicated. That might, that might ha hamper priority review uh, eligibility and ultimately PRV eligibility in the future. Um, we do do a legal analysis for our clients uh, on eligibility. It's helpful to bolster investor confidence that your product is eligible now. And if you have one of the, if you're operating in one of the programs with this firm sunset provision, uh, it's been helpful for our clients to see our analysis of how Congress has, has mechanically extended the programs over time to establish a congressional course of conduct that gives some of our clients' investors uh, significant uh, confidence that, uh, look, just because we're approaching a sunset doesn't necessarily mean that the whole incentive is going to go away. Um, and outside of the conditional designation of the rare pediatric disease application, which as Richard rightly said, is probably the best you're going to get from FDA in any PRV program, it, you're not going to get that type of assurance in any of the other programs. So it is though important to engage the FDA in your regular you know, kind of segmented type B meeting requests to inform the agency of your intent to request a priority review voucher uh, at the NDA or BLA filing. Now, I will tell you the response that you're going to get is really an enumeration of statutory eligibility criteria that you will have to meet. They're really not going to weigh in much at all uh, until right before NDA or BLA approval. And honestly, you won't know until um, you know, your product is approved or licensed and the PRV is awarded. There's a few caveats to that, but my, my kind of foot stomp uh, home run argument here is get it on their radar so that they know you're thinking about this. The other thing is just to say that this is a race. The Priority Review Voucher Program is a race. I've been very tempted by our BD staff here to reference Ricky Bobby, you know, if you're not first, you're last. Uh, but I will just say it's, it's a winner take all system. You have to monitor your competitors that are doing R&D in this space. Uh, if there, somebody else is studying the same active ingredient or potentially uh, looking at the same indication as you, you need to really be aware of where they are. Uh, we, we've actually had clients miss out on the PRV 
uh, just by a couple months, just because another competitor filed for the same molecule, uh, you know, just a couple months before these happened to be collaborators. And so, you know, there was a little bit of a, an issue about which horse should be going first, et cetera. So it is a race and you need to monitor your competitors. And I'll also say here, uh, last point under the determining eligibility, um, FDA's determination and maybe even a denial is not immutable. They're still subject to the Administrative Procedures Act in terms of decision making. Uh, there's still an appeals process that goes through the Senate director uh, or even uh, the ombudsman within, within the agency. Uh, we've, we've actually led successful appeals within uh, FDA and had denials overturned where we felt uh, that our client had met the statutory requirements for PRV eligibility and ultimate uh, award at approval. Uh, two other quick buckets here for practice tips to mention, then we'll turn to questions. Uh, probably the most important thing, if you are not on the cusp of NDA or BLA submission, is that you're dealing with some type of collaboration or partnering agreement. And here is really where it's, uh, you're, you're essentially negotiating business terms up front with regard to how these PRVs are going to be handled if they're awarded. You're trying to speculate or forecast in advance what's going to happen. And really, you know, we counsel parties to determine each party's equitable interest uh, in, in a PRV if it's sold. If you have investors, you know, what part of the cut of the PRV do those investors need to see uh, to, to get them in the game? If you have a collaborator and you've, you've essentially been developing this product uh, jointly, uh, what split of the priority review voucher is going to go to which company? Uh, will you even be required to sell the voucher? Does the sponsor under your collaboration and partnering agreement have the ability to keep that and use it into the future? Uh, can you be bought out? Do you need to sell it? If you do need to sell your PRV, what is the split between the parties? Um, and then really we've seen, you know, how are you going to deal with a lot of the post-market requirements or commitments that might need to be funded afterwards? All of these things have to be figured out in your partnering agreement sometimes a decade before you're going to get the priority review voucher, honestly. So we have been brought in many times to help companies, you know, negotiate through these various uh, complex considerations in, in the context of partnering agreements. In addition, sale or auction, um, it's important if you are selling your priority review voucher to monitor the valuation of those vouchers on the market and identify the optimal market time. You won't see them sold more than about six months apart, most likely. Um, and, and there's certain ways to go about uh, doing that. You can do it independently. You can find a private buyer. Many times there uh, is a private brokerage firm or auction house that will sell your voucher for you. A lot of companies just simply do not feel comfortable uh, selling an asset of this value. Again, we're talking around a $100 million asset. Uh, some companies are just not comfortable with that. But if you do get to the ultimate purchase or sale of the asset, uh, it is good to have firm legal counsel help you as you're negotiating purchase price, closing terms, uh, and making sure that just like any other asset deal, that the terms in terms of title, passing of the title and all the other reps and warranties for both parties are included. And the most important thing, of, of course, is to kind of cross the T and dot the I and make sure that FDA is given notice of the transfer of the PRV from the uh, awardee to the, uh, the transferee or the buyer. Um, and the rest of it, frankly, is, is kind of a standard asset arrangement uh, with some general terms that most of you will be familiar with. Again, we've seen these PRVs, all three different statutory programs from many different angles, and um, you know, would be happy to support uh, you, your, your team if there's a need. I also want to make sure we have some time for some questions here. So I'm going to pause. I will also just reiterate what our CLE code is here before we respond to questions. It is Venable FDA 23, V-E-N-A-B-L-E FDA 23. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Richard who's been monitoring our chat for some questions. Yeah, we've got, uh, I think two questions here so far. Um, first is regarding the number of patients. Uh, who or how are the number of patients for a disease set uh, determined? For example, there are questions of how many pediatric uh, sickle cell trait patients exist, 200 or uh, 300,000, and are there exceptions or waivers for this criteria? 
Uh, that's a great question. You would certainly be adjudicating the patient size in your pre-IND uh, package with the agency and uh, adjudicating you know, your clinical protocol with the agency. We found in the rare pediatric disease space that the total N of patients is incredibly small. Uh, we've seen studies authorized under 30 patients before, uh, something that, that's got a broader uh, a broader incident and a larger patient population probably wouldn't get approval for something that small. But this is honestly a negotiation based on the prevalence data with the agency itself. You can do this in the context of your pre-IND. Uh, it'll most likely come out and emerge from your orphan drug designation and your rare pediatric disease designation. Um, and I think that that will help you at least frame the right number to pitch to the agency. There is not a standard rule uh, across the board. Uh, got another question here. Uh, will there be any PRV-like programs in other countries? Oh, that's a great question. Hmm. I don't know that I have any insight on that. I have um, I teach uh, international regulation at a, at a couple of universities, and so you see a lot of times the MA or the TGA in Australia or the PDMA they will build their programs based on some of these uh, innovations here within the United States. Uh, I, I actually have not seen another priority review voucher program. That's not to say that there's not a winner take all mechanism. I do know for sure that the Ministry of Health in the UK has a prize challenge. It's essentially a award based challenge. So to say that other countries don't have pool incentives, that would not be accurate. There is exclusivity. Uh, that is protective for new, new chemical entities elsewhere. There are prize challenges that are issued in these spaces uh, at the EMA and the Ministry of Health in the UK, uh, and there are analogous programs. It might not be a PRV program, uh, which is, again, a six-month review versus 10-month review clock, but I am tracking that there are significant pool incentives offered. Uh, I can also say probably the horizon the next horizon for, for real incentives is what we've seen in the GAIN Act to incentivize development of products to treat multidrug resistant bacterial or fungal infections. That is where if you go to bio or you kind of play in the space of push-pull incentives, that's where I am hearing the next development, whether that'll be a voucher program or whether that will be some sort of kind of a prize challenge. But that seems to be the other underserved area um, that, that it needs to be incentivized and people are trying to find specific incentives to drive to that target. No, there are specific questions. Okay. Right now. Well, that's wonderful. Well, listen, any closing comments from the panel here? No. no. Yep. Okay. We're good. Then I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, if there are additional questions, our contact information is on the slides and uh, you can rewatch the webinars at the very beginning. We'd love to respond if we've not met you personally and you happen to be in and around the DC area. I know Justin, Richard and I would love the opportunity to have coffee with you. And um, you know, we're just, uh, we, we enjoy these topics as food and drug lawyers. We like also to contribute to see our clients develop and introduce medical breakthroughs for the public health and the benefit of our national security. So we, we enjoy what we do. We find this area to be fascinating. We wish all of you the very best as you are in this space and trying to navigate the complexities of PRV uh, awards and statutory programs. And we're here for you if you have any need whatsoever. Thank you again for coming today.